All right. Uh, I know most of the people that are coming on right now are going to be people that have been a uh, long time watchers of the channel, but this one might get some people that are new to free field training to come on and watch the video. So I am a police officer. My name is Tommy. Uh, this is my channel, Free Field Training, and I am a field training officer. And on the channel, I try to talk about police training and reasonableness in law enforcement and how police training works and try to people give people tips and tricks of how to do police work and security work better because that's what I do. I'm a full-time police officer and I'm a training officer and I also work security on the side. So let's talk about it. Uh, the big question that people get all the time is what is field training like for a police officer? In case you don't know, when you get hired as a police officer, a lot of people think that the academy is the end of training. It's not just the beginning. The academy is your basic training. It's the very beginning of police work. And then after the police academy, after your 12 or 16 or 20 weeks or whatever it is in the state that you're at, you go to a field training officer. Field training officer is an experienced police officer with three to five years to start on uh, for the youngest of them and then all the way till the end of their career for the oldest of us. And you go with an experienced police officer and they show you the ropes. They show you how to apply what you learn in the academy to police work on the street. Okay. So, but how is that accomplished? Well, back in the day, this used to be accomplished by, they'd put you in a car with somebody and be like, all right, go teach them how to do it. And you go out and just do kind of the best you could. Well, that didn't work out really well because some people don't work out as cops. Some people aren't good at it. And then how do you get rid of those people? And how do you document why they weren't good at it? And how do you document when people are good at something? And how do you make sure that somebody's taught everything they're going to need to know, especially in a place that doesn't get a lot of work? How are you going to teach somebody everything that they need to know by just doing it as it comes along? Like a lot of places aren't going to have a homicide while they're in training, right? So you have to talk about it and game it out. And so systems were put in place over the years to like have a playbook for field training. That playbook is called a DOR, the Daily Observation Report book, right? And that is where we put the evaluations every day and all the paperwork from field training. And then there's another book, it's called a training task book, right? And that is a stack of tasks. And I wish I had one right here to show you, but I'm kind of doing this on the fly because people ask me on another live stream and do a live stream about field training process. But everything is in the training task book, right? So we've got a book. I think my department's got like 42 training tasks. And so it starts off with day one protocol, showing people around the car. Here's how a spotlight works. Here's how the radio works. Here's how the computer works and all of that, because that's all agency specific. That's not something that you're going to learn at the police academy. And then from that all the way to what to do at a major catastrophe scene, how to interoperate with the fire department, using the radio, all of that, everything handling criminal sexual assault, all of that is a training task. A training task is just a list of things to talk about with a trainee. And then you sign off that, yes, we have both gone through this and we both understand what's going on with it, right? So when you, you come into field training, you get assigned to a field training officer and they, I'm going to go over the Sokolov model. There's also the San Jose model, which is similar, but uh, I'm not as expertly trained in. So we're going to go over the Sokolov model. The way field training works is you show up, you get assigned to a training, a field, an FTO, and that person then takes you with them for their day's work. So when I have a trainee, the trainee is with me in the car, and that person does everything that I'm going to do. And on top of that person doing everything I'm going to do, we're going to do one or two training tasks a day where we're going to go like, we're going to go over this, and then we're going to go over it several times before we sign off on it and say, all right, now this person knows how to do this right? And every day we're going to fill out a daily observation report. And the daily observation report for the program that, that we're using where I'm at is a, a pretty simple form. It's got a bunch of categories for stuff people are doing. So the first one is like appearance and uh, interpersonal relationships. And then the second one's going to be like geography. And the third one's going to be officer safety. And it goes on down the line of different things, you know, note taking and court procedures and report writing and paperwork and all that. So uh, motor vehicle operation, things like that. And then there's a column for them that's, uh, sorry, meets, you know, exceeds standards, meets standards, yes, meets standards, no, and then another column for not responding to training, right? So for each of those categories, they're going to get a mark in one of those areas for the day, right? 
we used to use the San Jose model, which is a one, two, three, four, five, or, you know, one to 10 system. And it was kind of an objectively, how is this person doing on this on any day that the FTO would do? But now we have meet standards, yes, meet standards, no. And then the extreme, like they're exceeding standards or they're not responding to training, right? And the standards are given to the trainee day one. They're handed a book. In the book, you open it up and there's a little paragraph for what what is meeting standards, yes, and what is meeting standards, no. For, for instance, for geography, where I'm at, meet standards, yes, would be for geography, you know, probationary officer knows what street they're on at any given time, period. Probationary officer can find addresses without using GPS or map, period. Probationary officer knows what mile marker they're on on the highway without looking for mile markers, period. Probationary officer can navigate to within two houses of any location at night without using spotlight, period. Like there's all sorts of things that they have to be able to do to be meeting standards, yes. And the meeting standards, no, is basically the opposite of that, right? And there's these for each of these categories. So at the end of the day, I've been taking notes all day on the daily observation report of how they're doing. And then at the end of the day, we go over them and they get a score about whether the meeting standards, yes, meeting standards, no, they're exceeding standards, or if they have been meeting standards, no, for a long time, and we've been giving them additional training if they're not responding to training, right? And it's not until that they get onto not responding to training that this really becomes an issue with the probationary officer where like we have to talk about whether they're going to, they're going to stay on as a cop anymore. It's a convoluted system because it's it's police department paperwork. Trust me, there's more. So I'll have a person, let's say I get them new. They're in the passenger seat. I'm driving for the first month, pretty much. I try to get them into the driver's seat as fast as I can, but at least the first few weeks, they're going to be in the passenger seat and they're going to have their book out and they're going to be, you know, trying to navigate. Like navigator job starts day one, or sorry, day two, they're going to be the navigator. The first day, it's kind of like a, it's a non-evaluation day. It's just to kind of get to know each other. And then day two, they start as navigator and we start adding tasks on top of them navigating. And it normally takes a few months for them to learn all the geography that they need to learn where they're not like in their book trying to navigate every day, right? And they get the navigation down to where that's second nature, but we start that day two. And then we do the first day protocol on the first day and normally into the second day before we sign off on it. And that's where they're learning to use radios and stuff in the car. And then it, it, everything builds on the stuff that you had before. So the training tasks go in a, in a logical order. And then I write at the end of the day how they're doing for it, right? And we take notes throughout the day of, all right, they did this well, they did this poorly. They did this well, they did this poorly, you trained on this. Here's what I taught them. Here's how I taught them. Here's what methods I used to teach them. And then that's phase one. And so there's a, a four-phase system, right? So they're going to have a phase two officer. They're going to go to somebody else. And then a phase three officer, they're going to go to somebody else. And then for phase four is called shadow at the end of it. And they're going to come back to me. So I get this person who doesn't even know how to operate the car, has no idea how the spotlight works, theoretically, if it's some goofy college kid. And then by the time they come back to me, the idea at shadow is the last two weeks, sorry, the first two weeks of shadow, like I, I make sure they're all right. And then the last two weeks, I come in in plain clothes, kind of like I am now, and it's them. And I'm just watching them work, which is my favorite part because I get to do a lot less work and I get to come dress however I want. And I get to see the, the fruits of the labor of, of all this work that I put into it. Cause first phase is a lot of work. Like you don't realize how much stuff, you know, until you have to teach other people that stuff, right? So like, you don't realize how much there is to know about operating the two radios in the car. until you have to teach it to somebody else. And you're like, Oh, what is this thing called again? And you're like trying to remember it, right? So it's, you see the fruits of, of your labor. So I really enjoy being an FTO. Between each phase, we do an end of phase evaluation and we pass before we pass them on to the next phase so they know how they're doing. So the FTO process, ideally, you get your evaluation, like what, what you're going to be evaluated against, what the training standards are, and then you work on training tasks with the FTO and they tell you how you're doing every phase and you go on to the next officer and they teach you more stuff and it builds on itself. And that's it. I like to liken it to making to like making a, a statue out of marble, right? You get a block of marble, and you send it to the academy, and it kind of roughs out something that kind of looks like a cop, but isn't really quite put together. Anybody that's seen a, a brand new guy come to a shift first day knows what I mean. Like, it kind of looks like a cop. Like, most people would see it and be a cop, and most cops would look and be like, 
Is that there's something wrong with that cop? Oh, yeah, he's new. That's, oh, okay, he's new. That makes sense, right? And then phase one, we start chipping away at that marble, right? And we make it into something that kind of looks more like a cop. And then phase, you know, two, it looks more like a cop. And phase three, it looks a whole lot like a cop. It's doing pretty good. And phase four, we're just kind of, we're polishing the marble and trying to make it look right, right? Something that's presentable. And you'd be like, and then at the end of phase four, the last phase at Shadow, I can go to the chief and be like, hey, here it is. Here's the cop we made you. And hopefully they go, oh, good, thanks. Here's your overtime slip. That's the field training process. It's not an exciting part of police work. It's not a sexy part of police work. It's not something people are going to be making movies about. And it's not anything that's going to get you awards or medals. And most places won't give it just won't even get you a special patch. It's just it's something you do kind of for the love of the game. Because I don't know anybody that makes enough extra money doing field training work that it would be worth the effort that they put into it. It's you're you're never going to be compensated for your effort being a field training officer, but it's it's rewarding work. And like I tell a lot of people, and like I say at the, the bio on my webpage, like, I think that, like, my success is I measure it by the success of my trainees, right? I have guys that I trained that are on the SWAT team. I have a couple guys that I helped train and that I trained. I was primary for a guy that's on our narcotics team, our tech team. I've got people that I trained that, you know, went on to do, to do really great things in law enforcement. That's how I... I measure my success as a police officer, my success as a field training officer, right? So that's our second live stream of the day. That was a very good question. I wish I remember uh, who gave that question, but now we're going to go back to the top and we're going to go through questions. And for the purposes of brevity in the live stream and for making it kind of all one thing, I'm going to answer all the questions that are about the field training process first, right? Let's go up to the top. Officer Q says first, <laughs> that's, that's exciting. Tim says, love your videos. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Matt Jeter asks, what is one of the worst things to do while going through field training? Do you have any pet peeves that you picked up while being an FTO? All right, we're going to do, we're going to do the last one first, right? My pet peeve as an FTO is people that ride in the right lane, like they drive in the right lane on a multi-lane road right up by the curb because the right lane tends to bounce and I get seasick. And then people have this tendency, like when they're trying to make a left-hand turn, like they'll pull their car into traffic. And if you're the in the passenger seat of a squad car while someone's doing that, like they pull out in front and the car's got to like swerve around them and stuff. Like I see my life flash before my eyes enough with letting some, some goofy college kid drive me around in a police car with the lights and sirens going. I would really like if people would just stay out of that right lane where I'm going to get smashed into and like the car's going to be up in my lap and I'm going to vomit because I'm, I'm getting seasick from bouncing up and down. Like that's my pet peeve. And uh, what's one of the worst things to do while going through field training? The worst thing for a probationary officer to do while going through field training would be to like not be teachable. And it's easy to say that and like, I guess I should elaborate. The worst thing that they could do is blow off the stuff that you're teaching them. And I think a lot of guys, not a lot of guys, but some people come into the field training process and they think it's going to be like the academy where they can just kind of skate under the radar. And eh, as long as I show up every day, they, they have to pass me. And so they don't learn anything. They don't think there's anything to learn. And so they just kind of play lip service to listening to you. And then they do it however the hell they want to anyway. And like, ah, oh, that's good enough. And that's like, that's the opposite. Like really the only real training you're guaranteed at a police department ever is when you're in field training. They're putting you with this person that knows significantly more than you do. Even if you're coming from another agency to a new agency, right? Like let's say I left and went to, you know, Las Vegas PD, which would be cool. But like I left and went to Las Vegas PD. Like that cop that's worked 10 years for Las Vegas PD knows way more about how to do police work in Las Vegas than I do coming from where I'm at. So why not listen to him, right? And that's that's the worst thing you can do is just blow it completely off because then you're never going to get better. And that's a, that's a terrible habit to get into being like, well, I already know as much as I need to know, so why learn more? It's stupid. That's how people get fired. Because they come into the job thinking they don't need to learn anything new. And then when they're not responding to training, it's like, well, we're teaching him to do this stuff. And he's still doing it his way that he did it at his last place. And they sit down with the boss like, why are you doing it? It's like, well, it works fine. And that's when you get fired. 
Black Dolphin says, what would you say are the things that would fail the person who is being trained under the FTO? All right, if you're in field training, the easiest way to get fired, to fail, would be to not learn geography. That's the easiest way to do it. Uh, not learn geography and not be able to multitask and uh, not be able to follow directions, simple directions, right? Hey, dude, you need to search him before you want to handcuff him. I know this guy. Trust me, search him first. He's always got weapons on him. I already searched him. I don't hear about it. You already searched him. Listen, it's very simple directions, right? If you can't follow directions from the person that is day-to-day -day evaluating you while sitting in the passenger seat writing about every little thing that you do, and you can't follow the very simple directions that they give you, especially if they give you a reason, but you can't follow simple directions and say, no, don't do that. You do that anyway. Did, how can how can I then go to the boss and be like, oh yeah, this guy's going to do great when you tell him to do something. You know what I mean? Like you have to look at it. The FTO is this weird amalgamation of like another patrol officer and a trainer and your first real direct supervisor, right? Like we have to directly supervise this one person. If you have one-on-one -on -one supervision and you can't follow simple directions, how are, how are the bosses that are going to make the decision about whether to keep you or not going to see that? If I go to them and be like, well, I told them, well, why did he do that? Well, I told them not to. Well, why did he do it then? Because he's not following directions. What are they going to think then? They're going to think, well, this guy's going to be a problem later on down the road when I give him something to follow. A lot of people fail field training. It's not for that reason, though. Uh, they fail it for or not being able to learn geography. That is one of the hardest things. And you don't have the time to sit there with your little GPS and find the address with the GPS. And that just doesn't work. For a variety of tactical reasons, that doesn't work. You have to know the geography of your town. The GPS is not going to tell you how to park four houses down because some dude is inside the house with a rifle and the call is that he's holding somebody hostage. The GPS is not going to teach you that. It's going to tell you where the house is at. It's, it's, it's terrible to rely on that. Like You need to know the geography of the area you're working in. Brandon says our FTOs at the jail don't even go to FTO school and are not labeled that anymore. Now it's just senior officers train them. It kind of sucks and varies on training and making weaker and weaker officers. That is a problem in some places. I know a lot of places that they'll have somebody that's right out of probation. So they've got a year or two years on and they'll assign them somebody to teach and they have no outside training. It's terrible. It's a bad, bad idea. That's raising a lot of liability issues for departments. They're, they're penny wise and dollar dumb, right? Oh, we, can, we don't have time to send you to this training. We don't have the resources to send you to this training. We don't have the money to send you to this training. But we're going to have you train this other guy that's going to bring with him millions of dollars in civil liability. <coughs> Unfortunately, a lot of government is penny wise and dollar dump. Uh, uh, Black Dolphin says, How important is it to ask plenty of questions as a trainee uh, with the FTO? Can too many questions be annoying? Well, uh, too many questions aren't annoying if you're not asking the same question over and over again. The big problem that I have with people asking questions is that they'll they'll quest, they'll answer shop, they'll ask me a question, and then they'll go ask somebody else the same question, and then they'll go ask the boss the same question, and they don't realize we're all talking to each other, and we're probably all in these positions because we're all going to give pretty much the same answer. And they'll question shop until they find that one boss that is going to give them some other answer that they want. And that's annoying for a, a field training officer it's annoying for the sergeant who's going to ask, the first thing they're going to ask you is, why aren't you asking your FTO that? And it's also annoying for all of us because this is what other people do. They do cop shopping and cop shopping is really annoying. We're like, I'll go to a call and then two hours later, they'll call back again, hoping to get a different cop. And I show up, I'm like, what are you calling again for? They're like, oh, well, I was hoping to talk to somebody else because I didn't like your answer. All right, well, you're out of luck. You still get me. And in seven hours, when you call again, you're going to get somebody else who's going to tell you the same thing. Brock says, I know that FTOs expect you to mess up uh, because you're new, but what is the big no-no in terms of mistakes? The big no-no, the thing that we can't have any latitude in, the thing we can't get breaks for is officer safety, right? On stuff that we've already taught. So there is no, there's no latitude on officer safety stuff, right? We've taught you to search people before you put them in the lockup, right? We've taught you when you search someone, you find a knife, you don't throw it on the hood of the car like they do on, on old cops TV shows. You don't throw it on the hood of the car, you secure it somewhere else. You either put it in your pocket, you drop it on the ground, you do something. You don't throw it up on the hood right in front of where you have their hands on the hood, right? So if you do something like that, even if we're not 
angry about it the first time, there's no second chances on officer safety stuff. It's getting written in the book, and it's going to get marked off that, that you did something wrong. <coughs> With most things in field training, there's like, you do something wrong, and I go, well, you didn't know that, and I tell you. And then the second time, I'm like, hey, listen, this is important. This is why it's important. Do a little counseling. And then we start writing, like, all right, now it's going in the book. Like, you keep screwing this thing up. 20 times in a row, you're screwing this up. We got to start writing in the book. You give people a lot of latitude with geography, right? Because they get a relatively large amount of time and it's a difficult topic. But where you you find a weapon on someone and where you put that weapon afterward, that's an issue. Or transporting someone without searching them. I think guys handcuff somebody up, put them in the back curb. Like, did you search them? No. All right, well, now you got to search them and I'm going to hold on to them. Now you got to search the back seat. <coughs> you didn't search them. That's, that's the big no-no is the, the officer safety mistakes are the big no-no during field training. Everything else we can kind of get around. I like to say that I can fix paperwork. Like, we can fix paperwork. And it might take a lot of time. Like take, it might take a lot of memos and a lot of carbon copies, but we can fix paperwork. We can't fix the knife through your skull. Right? We can't fix somebody getting cut. We can't fix somebody getting hurt. <laughs> uh MG says, my FTO is mean to me. He micromanages everything I do. That's his job. That's kind of his job. Um, he might think that you need micromanagement. And that might just be his leadership style. And being mean to you, like, it's, he's not there to be your friend. And some people are a little more mean than others. I have this thing where, like, I tell guys, like, you have to understand that I'm not going to yell at you. So if I'm yelling at you, it's because you're about to get hurt. Not necessarily by me. You're about to get hurt because you're doing something like inordinately stupid that's going to get somebody hurt. Like if I'm yelling at you, you've done something cataclysmically wrong. Some guys just yell all day about everything. You can't do it that way. You got to do it this way about like what color pen to use. I don't get into that. Um, and mean to me is, you know, could mean different things to different people. But that's like his job is to be there and to teach you. And you don't have to like him for him to do that job. Life According to Ed Sell says, any tips on how to maximize that learning experience and are there any particular efficient ways to learn geography? There are a few particular ways to learn geography. I should probably do a separate video on this, but I'm going to give it to you right now, right? The best way I found to learn geography is chunking, right? Chunking is, a, is something that a lot of people, like people, whether they're visual learners or they're auditory learners, they can learn better by chunking information, right? So if you learn geography, you take a little area, like a three square block area, and you learn those streets, right? And you memorize them in order. And you learn where all the addresses are at. And then you take that chunk of information, you attach it to another chunk of information you learn the next day. Now you know both of these, and you make sure you use them in conjunction with each other all the time. And then you add a chunk onto that, and you add a chunk onto that, and you add a chunk onto that, and you add a chunk onto that, right? Some towns are easier than others. Some of them have number streets, you know, go east and west, and um, name streets go north and south. Some of them do the opposite. Some of them mix them all up, right? But chunking is a great way to learn information because some of it is just going to be root memorization. Like, if you've got a bunch of streets with names, you're going to have to learn those names in order in order to know which one's coming after which one. And if it's numbers, you know, the numbers are pretty easy because hopefully the numbers are in order, but you have to, like... You have to chunk up those names, memorize them in chunks, and then add other chunks to them. And then you learn blocks by groups of blocks together on where stuff is at. Dan says, learn the longest and main streets first. It's usually easier if you live in a city with a grid system. That's very true. So you take those chunks and you attach them to those major streets. Where I'm at, I don't get a lot of people who don't know what the major streets are, right? The big four lane streets. Um, the other thing you have to think about is you have to you have to start start off memorizing intersections. Most people are going to come in knowing like the basic outline of the town and the major streets, the intersections, because intersections give you your address breaks uh, for when you have to turn into neighborhoods. So it's good to memorize those intersections. So what I'll do is I'll give people a map of town and I'll be like, I want you, we're going to drive around on all the major streets and you're going to circle every intersection. And then once you know the major streets and the intersections... You know, you've got that on your map. We're going to start chunking, chunking and learning neighborhoods. It's a very good point, Dan.
Adrian Bream says, how do you learn on the job if your FTO program was lacking? Well, even if your FTO program isn't lacking, when you get done with the academy and you get done with FTO, you should find someone on your shift that you can hang out with. Hopefully you've got, you're at a place that's big enough or you've got somebody else there that you can hang out with. Ask them to ride with you, right? Ask them, hey, can I ride with you for a night? I just want to, you know, I want to learn some new stuff. I want to learn from new people. Or just say, hey, I want to hang out. Let's go, let's hang out and like, let's ride together tonight and have fun or whatever. But ride with somebody else if you have that option. That's the best way to learn is to work with other people and see how they do it. Learn, you know, you learn four different ways to skin a cat in field training from different field training officers. Learn a fifth way and a sixth way and see what works for you. <laughs> MG says, why do FTOs forget what it's like to be a rookie? Not all of us do. I distinctly remember being terrible at this job. Distinctly. And I think it makes me better at doing it now is remembering the time that I didn't know. But some guys don't. And that's just a function of people. Like every person is different. And some people are just jerks. And I'm sorry, dude, yours might just be a jerk. It's been known to happen. Matt says, do you prefer a trainee who has been an officer before or new to police work? I prefer a trainee who is open to learning. That's all I ask of them. If they're a new officer, that means more work for me, but that's not necessarily a bad thing for me. I enjoy my work. Uh, if they're, a, a, I've had like seasoned veteran police officers that were some of the best trainees that I ever had. It was like, we came on and we had a lot of fun. I was like, hey, you can't do that. And they're like, oh, we'll fix it. And like, oh, this is how we do it here. And I've had other guys that came on from other places that were just a complete disaster. Complete disaster. So it's it's about the individual. It's about how willing they are to learn and what skill sets they bring to the table to start with. And some prior police officers come with awesome skill sets and some come with terrible skill sets. Bad things that they've learned at other places. You go around the internet and YouTube, like you'll see a lot of people or forums or like Police One magazine and you'll see articles written by people who clearly have no idea what they're talking about. Clearly have no idea what they're talking about. They're just making stuff up that they've heard, right? Like guys come to other from other agencies that have no idea what they're talking about, that this place, they had some sergeant that told them something. They took it as the God's honest gospel truth, and now they don't want to listen to you. They're like, well, I've been doing this like this for years. I'm like, well, you're going to get hurt. You can't do that. It's not a good idea. Hey, you're going to get sued. You can't do that. That's not a good idea. You know, like I've had guys come to me and be like, oh, was, you lock somebody up. You could just search the car. And you're like, ah, slow down there, homie. Gant was, was quite a while ago, right? Like, you haven't had a law update since you went to the academy? Well, I mean, you can search the car anyway because you're, you're in an inventory, right? Well, but we're talking about different things. We're not talking about a search incident to arrest. We're talking about an inventory search because we're impounding the car. We're towing it. If we're not towing it, we don't get the search, right? Like, like there's, there's stuff, stuff changes over time. Sebastian says we don't have FTOs in bail enforcement. Judging by some of the stuff that I see on the internet, I think maybe you should. <laughs> I see I see some people that like look really squared away and really smart and other ones that are like doing some really dumb stuff. So like, maybe you should. Maybe there should be like a nationwide organization of trainers for bail enforcement. Do a video on geography. We may have to do that in the future. Black Dolphin says, should you only learn your district only? If it's a big city, you're going to have districts, but you need to know the geography of, of the whole city. And if you're in a smaller town, you need to know the geography of your city first or your district first, and then you need to learn the surrounding area, right? Especially if you, you do pursuits, right? Like I've had pursuits go into the next state, four towns over, up all over the place. Like you need to have a general idea of the geography of the area around where you work too. Matt Cheater says, would you recommend just driving around and learning streets? I would recommend that when you're not working, if you're having trouble with geography, you come in on your time off and just an hour or two at a time, drive around. Like make a list of addresses. I've had people that I said, all right, well, you're having a problem with residential addresses. Go find all the addresses in town that are for sale, right? So go online, print out all the addresses in town that are for sale, and then drive to those addresses. And that's how you get better at geography. It's just through through repetition, through learning, through, through like driving those addresses and having to use the information. Sebastian says, our mains are the names of the presidents. Are you and Gary, Sebastian? Are you and Gary? 
It's okay. You can admit it. I loves me some Gary, Indiana. <laughs> Freaky Artesian says, so no Google Maps then? No, generally not. Josh says, do officer down slash officer needs help type of scenarios on the road to reinforce the need to know geography? That was a butt puckering, humbling moment for me. It, yeah. And, and here that comes pretty early. The people were like, hey, you, we need to get there. Like he's yelling for help. Time to go. Let's go. And, uh, and they're freaking out. And people start getting serious about geography pretty fast. Luckily where I'm at, well, luckily or unluckily where I'm at. That comes pretty early normally for people. Normally within the first few days, like there's something where we're like, we need to be there now. We don't have time for this. And I start telling them, turn left here, turn right here, go three blocks down, turn right, we're there. That's it. Right? And they're like, wow, dude, uh, I'm glad you were, well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I was here too because obviously we wouldn't have gotten there had you not known the geography. So normally like within a few days of them driving on their own, like it really sets in. If it didn't set in from me watching me drive, it sets in for them that they had no idea where they were going and I had to tell them to get there. And that was stuff that happened to me when I was in field training too, right? Like there's no judgment about that. Like that's, that's stuff that happens to everybody. Jeff says, my dad used to say that you can learn something valuable from every job you do. Now I know the value of those years of delivering pizzas. You know, that's the thing. If that's, if that's a skill set you come to police work with, that's a valuable skill set. That's something that you would never think to put on a, on a resume that would never come up. It's a valuable skill set. I like to sit down with guys when I first start training them and we do a little a little form about like what they used to do in the past. And a lot of FTOs will pass that up and be like, yeah, whatever, whatever you did. All right. Goofy college kid. But stuff like that comes up. We're like, oh, you delivered pizzas for three years. Where'd you deliver pizzas? Oh, here. Perfect. And I, look, then you're going to know the streets, right? That you can like find addresses and stuff. Sam Lee says my FTO for my agency asks, keeps asking if me, if I have questions, I don't have any. Sometimes I do, but I never have any when he asks, what should I be asking? I think you should be writing them down when you do have questions. Like when you sit at home and you're on the toilet at the end of the day, you're taking crap and you're like, oh, I should remember that. Make a little note in your phone or, or write a little note down and ask him when you go back into work. He's probably asking you if you have any questions because you haven't been asking anything, which is unusual. Jordan says, do you have any quick tips like satellite dishes pointing south for quick direction finding? Um... A lot of towns, you can tell your north, south, east, and west by whether it's odds or evens on the sides of the streets. So if you memorize which side of the street is the even side and which side is the odd street, you're going to be able to find that direction pretty easy. Uh, Matt asks a very good question. He says, "What?" He says, have you ever been riding as an FTO and randomly told the trainee, we've just taken shots at us, where are we to radio to dispatch? as hypothetical way to keep them attentive to where you were at. Yes, in fact, if I have, I do that, and if they don't know where we're at too much, if they're space, I think they're spacing out, we'll, we'll have a universal rule. I stole this from a board game. It was like, universal rule. Anytime I clap my hands, you have to tell me where we're at. You have to stop the car and tell, us, tell me where we're at. And then we'll just be driving around one day, like, and they have to remember, I got to tell them where we're at. So they have to pull the car over and be like, we are at blah, 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 blah. And that's like, that's my way of making them stay attentive. Adrian says, Chicago police roll around with three PPOs and one FTO per car. Would you ever recommend that? No, for a variety of reasons. Uh, FTO training should always be one-on-one -on -one training. It is like the only time you're going to get one-on-one -on -one training in, in police work. And that's how you make good police officers. You give them that one-on-one -on -one training time that they need. How are you supposed to learn? Is if I, had, I have a hard enough time filling out one daily observation report. Little three of them. It's that's dumb. I'm with the Chicago with the Chicago FTOs who and the, all of them will tell you that's dumb. That's not a way to do it. <laughs> Davis says, "Can you actually pursue into the next state?" Yes, yes, yes. We can. You can pursue two states over. You can pursue as far as you need to pursue if it's fresh pursuit. That's how the law works. It's not like the movies where like, oh, we're at the edge of our jurisdiction. We got to stop. That's not how that works. It's not how any of this works. Uh, Sam Lee 80 it always comes off good to a teacher trainer and is great for you learning to keep notes of the questions and you have to be prepared 
to talk to them when the opportunity comes up. It does. If somebody comes in with questions, start the day, hey, last night I thought about blah, 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 that looks great to me. Because then I know you're actually thinking about it. I know you're serious about the job. Gregory says, is it better to get a degree then join the them join the police force so I can get a detective or higher authority? Where I'm at, having a degree has nothing to do with being a detective. And it could have something to do with being a supervisor if um, the promotion board cares whether you have a degree or not. It's not necessary, really. It could help. Uh, Jared says, how long does the probation stages last? They're about a calendar month. Gonzo says, how often does the new guy buy lunch? I don't let the new guy buy lunch. I just don't. I also bring my own lunch, so it doesn't matter. Uh, Sam Lee says, thanks for answering. I use your advice. Another question. One of my FTOs is pretty outspoken and has said some racist stuff. Should I keep my mouth quiet or go up the chain on this stuff? That's a big boy question, buddy. You're a big boy, right? What do you think you should do? That's on you. That's a you in the mirror thing. I can't advise you on that. How serious is it? How serious is he about it? Who would you report it to? It's a person you're reporting it to. Do you think they're going to think it seriously or not? Big boy questions, man. That's like use of force stuff. That's big boy questions. You're going to make your own decisions in life about that. Barovis says, how... How far have you ever pursued and have you caught the guy? Did you have to take him all the way back? Uh, normally you have to take him all the way back unless it's in another state. If you pursue him in Indiana, uh, you lock him up and then, you know, whoever's primary jurisdiction is in Indiana is going to take custody of him. And then you issue a warrant and extradite him back. Uh, if it's in the same state, you pursue him to wherever and you bring him back. I mean, probably 50, 60 miles. Man, I've gone a long way on pursuit. Matt says, I currently live in Georgia, and I notice a lot of officers, both county and local, use GPS to get to calls. What's your opinion on this? They might not be using it to get to calls. If they're using it to get to calls, I think that's a terrible idea. Uh, but they might not be using it to get to calls, but a lot of guys I know will mount a GPS on the dash, and the reason is so that while you're driving, if you have that moment where, where the hell am I at, you can look at the GPS and you know where you're at at any time. It also helps with pursuits, especially longer pursuits, where you can look at the GPS and know where you're at, so when you're calling it in, You'd be like, all right, we're northbound on Main, passing 4th Street, and you don't have to know it in your head where you're at. You can look at the GPS, and they normally have it zoomed in pretty big so that they can see where they're at during the pursuit. Makes it a lot easier. Adrian says, how do you approach your FTO if he is dogging it, reading newspapers, never doing work, especially if you're trying to learn. Well, here's the thing. He's the guy that's going to be evaluating you or she's the girl that's going to be evaluating you. So there's not a lot you can do about it. If you go to their supervisor, they're probably just going to deny it anyway. So my suggestion would be to make the best of it and then find somebody, just like anybody else, find someone that who can mentor you when you're out of training. But hopefully you're not, like that's part of the reason why you don't just get one FTO, right? Like if your primary FTO is like that, then when you get your second one, they're probably not going to be that like that. And your third one, probably not going to be like that. So you have to find somebody else that you can you can learn from. And if you're going from FTO to FTO in your process, then hopefully you're going to have somebody that is going to teach you. And they might be someone who will later be able to do something about it, right? Like you go to your second phase FTO and you work with them for a while and they're working. You're like, you know, I'm really glad that you're teaching me so much. You know, the, you know, Mikey, the first guy, he, he read the newspaper a lot in the car. And your second phase guy might be like, he does what? <laughs> Hold on a second. Is that, it might get it might get somewhere when it's that. Hold on. 
I lost my place, I'm sorry. Ben asks, do you see an individual from your town being a better candidate because they know the people and can better relate to someone outside of your town who has no ties to the community? See, the thing is that the community is significantly larger than just a town. Like, I don't get into this, like, town size nationalism stuff. That's ridiculous, right? Like, there's no difference between the type of person that you're going to meet in, like, suburbs or farm towns and stuff that are, like, five miles separating them. That's that's crazy. Like, the, the, the nationalism, the, like, the city nationalism stuff is ridiculous, and there's, there's no difference. Like, if you get someone that's from, like, a really nice neighborhood on the north side of Chicago, and they come down to where I'm at, and they try to be the police, maybe they'll have trouble interacting with people at first, but they're going to learn how people interact down here. Like, they're going to learn the local the local flavor, the local culture. But, like, when it's, like, next door and stuff, and how far are people driving to be cops? Right? Like, because someone lives three towns away, that doesn't mean that they're not going to understand people who live where I work. That's, that's ridiculous. That's... I, I get that argument all the time. You're like, you should live in the town that you work in because you got to, you got to, they, they, they associate better with the people in their own town. You're like, no, that's really, do you shop in the town, only in the town that you live in? And do you work in only the town that you live in? Do you still interact with those people? Fine. Right. It's craziness. Barabas says, how far has another agency come to pursue into your jurisdiction? Several years ago, we had a Michigan State Police car come through. That's a ways. <laughs> uh, Matt says, our FTO time for the department I'm getting into is four months, and we switch back and forth from day to night every four months. Do you think it's beneficial to switch shifts every once in a while? I think it's beneficial to switch shifts every once in a while. I wouldn't do it every month if I could. I would do a three-month rotation. Gerardo Aguilar asks, as an FTO, are you responsible down the road if an officer you train failed to follow protocol or policy? No, but I do very often get asked about it. Hey, was this person, did you teach them this? They'll be like, nah, it wasn't me, homie. In fact, I have documentation saying I taught them the opposite. MG says, I had a girl hit me on me during training and my FTO glared at me. I don't know what to tell you, dude. All right, Islam love is just trolling, which is not helping anything. So he's gone. How do you deal when you show on a warrant check and there is abuse on a household member? I've seen a s in soak reports and nothing has been done. I don't know what that is. A warrant check? And there's abuse on a household member. I don't. I don't know what that is. Like we're going to a house to pick someone up on a warrant, and there's abuse. If there's if there's any abuse of a person, like of a protected party in a house, like a kid or an elderly person, like we report it. We report it up the chain, even if we don't have enough for. Like we report DCFS or the Department of Human Services in Illinois, even if we don't have enough to make an arrest. But if there's enough to make an arrest, we make an arrest. Uh, what was the Michigan guy pursuing for? I honestly don't remember. And he went through town, so it wasn't like he it stopped here. I never got to talk to him. How many FTOs are in your apartment? I think we have about 15. I missed the beginning. Can I get a quick recap? Uh, go watch it when we're done. It'll be up. It's staying up. The Lone Star State says, have you ever been accused of being racist from someone that you pulled over and interacted with? All the time. That's, that's a normal thing. If you're a cop and you've never had that happen, then you're not doing police work. Uh, Kiki says, I was disqualified for smoking weed within a year of applying. How long should I wait till I reapply? Well, you can reapply other places. You should probably get clean, though. Here's a fun story. Paul says, 2009, I was field training a rookie. Long story short, deer hit by car, euthanasia was authorized. 
Rookie went to dispatch deer, missed three rounds from six feet away. Deer jumped up and ran. He proceeded to dump an entire mag into the neighborhood, trying to pick off the deer. That was some paperwork. And no, he did not complete probation. <laughs> Gerardo says, do the rank of FTO come with time on the force? Or is it a rank given to those who want to teach? It's not a rank at all. It's just a job. It's like being an evidence tech. It's just a job you do. Two Guys Talking Podcast Network says, realizing that you don't get paid extra, does your work and effort eventually get appreciated? I get an hour of overtime for every day that I train someone. But that doesn't even come close to like, I do my work and then like a whole other job during the day. It doesn't doesn't like, doesn't pay. It's not, it's not real compensation for what I'm doing. But it is appreciated, and it's appreciated with an hour of overtime every day. Uh, Barvis says, have you ever... How do we start talking about pursuits? Have you ever been in a slow-speed pursuit? Yeah, I actually had a guy driving, he was on two flat tires, and I tried to pull him over, and he just kept going. And I was like, mm, this is entertaining. He ended up being really drunk. I'm glad that we boxed him in. Uh, two guys talking podcasting network says, are you outing yourself by parking backwards everywhere you go? Uh, no, a lot of people park backward here. That's, that's kind of normal. Like in the South Chicago land area, a lot of people will pull in the spots backward. So like, it's not just a cop thing here. Uh, Gerardo says, what happens if I missed it? If you, what happens if you fill your probation period or you terminated or give an extended probationary time? It depends. If you're just not responding to training at all, it's normally a termination thing. Um, if they're having specific problems and they need more work, then we extend, extend, um, their time in training. Oh, you mean probationary period? Normally they're that the probationary period is it. If you're not on a field training by the end of probation, you're done. But field training can be extended. In fact, it's built into the program that there's extension periods for things that you're going to have problems with. A lot of people get extended for geography. That's not a big deal. Do you think being an armored car guard, working for Brinks, Loomis, etc., is a good stepping stone toward becoming in law enforcement? What it does for you is it allows people to see that, it allows future employers, you know, your prospective police department who want to hire you, to see that you are responsible and that someone trusts you, a former employer trusts you with money and a big truck and a gun. We just did a live stream on graveyard shift burnt versus day shift. Go look at it. It's, it's literally the, the video right before this. Mitch says, how much training does your department do for uh, use of force training? I've heard departments doing only 10 hours a year total. I Well, everything you do that involves using forces, use of force training. So all the firearms training. So we do quarterly firearms training and qualifications. We do um, defensive tactics training, and we have a use of force component, and then we have the mandatory minimum Illinois State use of force training. But then in field training, like we do lots of use of force training, a lot of scenario-based use of force training. Ben says, last one, haha, what level of discretion, if any, do you give trainees? Well, trainees, I know different people have different ideas on this, but where I'm at it is, I'm less worried about what you do than your reasons for doing it, right? So I let trainees have the same level of discretion that I have, because in a few months, they're going to have to be able to exercise this, that discretion smartly, right? So are we arresting this guy? No. Why aren't we arresting this guy? The more important question isn't the, the judgment call of whether to arrest him or not, it's or whether to write him a ticket or not or whatever, it's what's your reason behind it? I want to know that they're thinking and I want to see that they have a legal and and smart reason why they're doing or not doing something. Clayton says, how do you feel about FTO saying to forget things from the academy? Some things from the academy will actually get you killed. 
And some things that some academies teach do need to be forgotten. That's the reality of the job. I'll tell you, I, I read Police One articles where I'm like, this guy has clearly not done this in 15 years. He clearly doesn't know what's going on. And those are the same people that teach at academies. Not all of them. Like, most of the stuff you get at the academy is good. But you have to remember that, like, the academy is only as good as the people that are teaching at it and the curriculum that they're teaching. Uh, Adrian asked, do laterals have to go through the full FTO program by you or is it abridged? Uh, ours have to go through the full process. I knew he wouldn't answer that question, LOL. I don't know what question it was. I'm trying to just pick out stuff that's about field training. Uh, Dove says, what is the last advice you give to a trainee the night before you start? they start going on their own? I tell them, go out the first night you're on your own, go pull a traffic stop. Because it's their first time that they're going to like go out and have an interaction with somebody and they're, they're purposely starting a negative interaction. right? Like you're going and you're pulling a traffic stop. If you don't pull a traffic stop that first night, you're going to put it off. And then it's going to be something you're afraid to do in the future. Go out and pull a traffic stop and have fun. Don't, don't learn bad habits. Make sure to remember to have fun, but go pull that traffic stop that first night so you, you get over that hump of having to go out and, and do proactive stuff alone. I don't know anything about constables. I'm sorry. Life according to Ashley. Some things from the academy will get you killed. Sips from container. Talk about mic drop. It's it's the truth. If you're a cop and you don't know that, you need to you need to start like reading your training keys and uh, reading up on new case law because if you're not seeing stuff that people are coming back from the academy going, whoa, that's not a good idea. You're you're not paying attention. Uh, MG says, could an FDO expedite your process if they feel you are ready? Um, they can under some programs, like the San Jose model, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, one evaluation sheet. They have a um, an expedited training program. Sokolov model that we use, they have to go through the whole process. Because if the person doesn't go through the whole process, then they could come back later if they mess something up and be like, well, I wasn't trained in it. They didn't give me the whole process. So you're supposed to give them the whole thing. With me, I, I can't just expedite their training. Uh, Gonzo says you recommend any first aid equipment to a new guy we actually issue it to him now which is nice how long have you been the police I've been the police 11 years Uh, Legion says, oh my goodness, is there anything that can't be taught during field and scenario training? During training to an, to an officer, say for instance, there are some skills that you have to learn by experience. There's lots of skills you have to learn by experience. How to, like, just how to deal with people is a skill that you, you're constantly going to be either challenging yourself with or getting worse at. Brandon says, do you plan on promoting? I don't plan on promoting. Uh, do military veterans make good police officers? Some of the very best cops that I've ever trained who got it instantaneously were military vets. Chad says, top two tips for an old guy, 40. Woo, starting the academy. This is going to be the last question because we're coming up on an hour and YouTube freaks out if it's over an hour, right? Top two tips for an old guy over 40 starting the academy. I feel for you. Uh, start running. <laughs> start get, getting in the best shape of your life. And um, don't take yourself too seriously. If you're coming into law enforcement late, don't take yourself too seriously, especially if you've never done it before. right? Remember that because you're not new to life, you are new to this job like any other job. You are new to it. right? So don't take yourself too seriously. Be open to learning new things and get in the best shape of your life because those kids are going to kick your ass. <laughs> All right. 
that's going to be it. We're coming up on an hour. So you guys all be safe. Uh, fentanyl and officer safety concerns should be coming out uh, later today. And I will see you all later. Take it easy.